Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 28, Deuteronomy 28. Now we are, uh, this is a very difficult passage. I don't know if any of you read it ahead of time. Uh, we went last week from the chapter 27 all the way through 27 and through uh, the first 14 verses of chapter 28. We, uh, the title is the, Bla the Curses of Mount Ebal, and we added in last time the blessings of Mount Gerizim. So that's verses 1 through 15 on Genesis, or I mean De De Deuteronomy 28. So then uh, you'll recall uh, last time I noted there's kind of a chiasm in this. So you start off with the curses, and then in the middle you have the blessings, and then you end up with curses again in, in the rest of chapter 28. That's what we're going to be reading tonight. It's kind of a gloomy prospect. You know, here on a cold winter's night, on a Wednesday night, come out in the dark, and you hear, you read this section that's full of just, you know, this is what's going to happen to you if you don't keep the covenant. That's what God is saying to Israel. And I have to say, I'm preparing you, it is hard to read. There's things in here that are very difficult. And we sometimes uh, have to think about, what, you know, why does God uh, include this? Why does he speak this way? And so you think about that question, because as we get to the end, I think that we're going to try to bring this to a resolution and think about what God is saying to us. What is he communicating to us? And uh, it, is a, it is a, how shall we put it, it is a type, a passage of scripture that in your Bible reading you probably skim over and don't think too deeply about because it's kind of hard to read. And uh, I hope you do read it in your annual Bible reading or however, whatever kind of schedule you're on. We should try to take in all the word of God and we should think about it and think about what God is saying. So, let's see, I have a couple of quotes I want to start with before I start reading the chapter. The first one uh, uh, comes from Constable, Tom Constable, who says there are about four times more curses than blessings in this text than the blessings in the, in the first part of the chapter. He says, the reason was probably to stress the seriousness of violating the covenant by describing the consequences in detail. Israel was entering a very dangerous environment in Canaan and needed strong warning as against yielding to the temptations she would encounter there. Now, I should mention, you know, we have, uh, as you read the, the, the first five books of the Old Testament, or the period of Exodus, I'd say, Exodus through Numbers, you're dealing with Israel in the wilderness. They are isolated. They're not, they don't have contact with outside nations as an influence all that much. Now, there's also, uh, Israel all by itself can fall into sin and break God's covenant. As you, as you note, you go through uh, number 16 and some of the other chapters in the Pentateuch where they have, God has dealt with them very severely and punished them for their misdeeds. But they were all on their own. It's sort of like, if you want to use this illustration, it's sort of like a camp experience. How many of you have ever gone to a Christian camp in the summertime? All right. A few of you? Okay, so. When you go to camp, you're in a, an environment where there's preaching, usually a, a chapel in the morning and chapel in the evening. So you have a lot of preaching. You, have, you go into your cabins. If you're the, uh, the camper, your counselor is leading you in devotions that night. Uh, you have competitions in the camp, sometimes are related to growing in uh, Bible knowledge. And it's quite a hothouse environment, in a sense, if you think about it as a Christian hothouse. And uh, people will talk about uh, camp decisions. So people, young people, go to camp, and they respond to the preaching. There's a call in the preaching to respond, to make commitments to live for the God, I, uh, to call to salvation, first of all, of course. But then, if you're a believer, there's a call to, to really dedicate yourself, to turn away from sin, and so forth. And there are decisions that are made at camp. It's a very valuable spiritual exercise, something that we've uh, had uh, various times in our church ministry. However, when you come home from camp, how long do the decisions last? You know, there's all these people outside that you interact with. If kids go back to school, they're interacting with kids that didn't go to camp, at least not to a Christian camp. And there's all kinds of influence. And this is what they're going to find as they come into the promised land 
suddenly they're in an environment where they're going to settle down and, they, and there are going to be these Canaanite neighbors that they will drive out gradually, but not completely. So God is being very stern with Israel. That's what he's saying beforehand. This is a preparatory message uh, in these verses. Now, another comment. This one comes from uh, Kylan Delich. The curse in case Israel should not hearken to the voice of its God to keep his commandments. That's their header for this paragraph. After the announcement that all these curses would come upon the disobedient nation, in verse 15, the curse is proclaimed in all its extent as covering all the relations of life. In a six-fold repetition of the word cursed in verses 16 to 19, as above in verses 3 to 6. I'll comment on that in just a minute. And the fulfillment of this threat in plagues and diseases, drought and famine, war, devastation of the land, and captivity of the people is so de depicted that the infliction of these punishments stands out to view in ever-increasing extent and fearfulness. We are not to record this, however, as a gradual heightening of the judgments of God in, por in proportion to the increasing rebellion of Israel, as in Leviticus 26, although it is obvious that the judgments threatened did not fall upon the nation all at once. So that's their introductory comment on the passage. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the passage itself and the organization of the passage. So we have in uh, verses 15 to 19, the opening curses. And there I want you to notice, and this is what uh, Kyle and Delich noticed, where it says, uh, it says the sixfold reputation of cursed, but he compares it to the blessing part. So we'll look back to the earlier part in verses 1 through 6 of the chapter, and you'll notice that there is quite a parallel in that section. So let's read this section first, then I'll note the parallel, and then we'll go on to the next section. So beginning in verse 15, But it shall come about, if you do not obey the Lord your God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, with which I charge you today, today uh, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the offspring of your body and the produce of your ground, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed you will be when you go out. Right, so that's the opening section of this little bit here in this chapter. Now let's look back to verses 1 through 6. Now it shall be, if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the offspring of your body and the produce of your ground and the offspring of your beasts, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. So you see how it's organized very much in parallel in these two sections. So the, the blessings on the one hand, these are the blessings of the covenant. On the other hand, these are the cursings of breaking the covenant. So God, if you break the covenant with God, he's telling Israel as a nation, if you break the covenant with God, what I promised you in blessing, I will take away from you in cursing. That's what he's saying. That's what this section uh, is referring to. And then one of the commentaries called the rest of the chapter the exposition of the curses. You know, in expository preaching, the... Uh, what we are doing, the, the word expository and exposition are related, and the word expose. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to expose all the implications and details and understanding of the text that is in front of us. So we're trying to go in often in quite narrow detail. Sometimes I get a little bit too detailed and too stuck in the weeds and you can't even see what the whole passage is about because I'm focusing on one word there in our text. But we do try to give a full understanding of what the word is saying to us. And so as we read the rest of this, he's laid out these general cursings that come for people who disobey the covenant. So I've got, I've tried to organize this in sections. I followed the paragraph markers at first and I read the commentaries 
and I came with these various headers. I don't know if I'm totally satisfied with all of my headers on these sections, but we, I'll just give, I'll read them to you. Uh, maybe I'll, uh, I'll, read, I'll read my headers first, and then we'll uh, read the passages. I may pause for any, uh, for comments partway through as we go through this. But uh, we're mostly going to be looking at the scripture here. Now, if you do have questions or if something's not clear, feel free to wave your hand and interrupt me. I may not say, you know, are there any questions or comments? But if there are, just sort of wave your hand, try to get my eye. I know sometimes it's hard. I'm not always looking up like I should be. But uh, just try to uh, get my attention and we'll try to uh, accommodate your questions or comments as we go along. So here's the headings, the afflictions of God's discipline. And I put in the brackets, disease and drought. And then the reverse of victory in God's discipline, verses 25 to 37. And we'll look at what that means. And then the economic devastation of God's discipline, 38 to 44. The political devastation of God's discipline, 45 to 57. The national dissolution of God's discipline, 58 to 68. All right. So that's, it's a long passage, so that's partly why I'm going to be doing all this reading, just to get ourselves through it. It shall come up, oh, sorry, I'm in verse 20. The Lord shall, will send upon you curses, confusion, and rebuke in all you undertake to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the pestilence cling to you until he has consumed you from the land where you are entering to possess it. The Lord will smite you with consumption and with fever and with inflammation and with fiery heat and with the sword and with blight and with mildew and they will pursue, pursue you until you perish. The heaven which is over your head shall be bronze and the earth which is under you iron. The Lord will make the rain of your land powder and dust. From heaven it shall come on, down on you until you are destroyed. Right, so this, I've called this uh, the afflictions of God's discipline. Disease and drought. You can, you, you can see in that language how he's talking about those kinds of punishments that would come on the nation. All right, so the next section, the reverse of victory. Verse 25, the Lord shall cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You will go out one way against them, but you will... Uh, flee seven ways before them. You will be an example of terror to all the kingdoms of the earth. Your carcasses shall be food to all birds of the sky and to the beasts of the earth. There will be no one to frighten them away. The Lord will smite you with the boils of Egypt, and with tumors and with the scab and with the itch from which you cannot be healed. The Lord will smite you with madness, with blindness and with bewilderment of heart. You will grope at noon as the blind man gropes in darkness. You will not prosper in your ways, but you shall only be oppressed and robbed continually with none to save you. You shall betroth a wife, but another man will, be, will violate her. You shall build a house, but you will not live in it. You shall plant a vineyard, but you will not use its fruit. Your ox shall be slaughtered before your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Your donkey shall be torn away from you and will not be restored to you. Your sheep shall be given to your enemies, and you will have none to save you. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people while your eyes look on and yearn for them continually, but there will be nothing you can do. A people whom you do not know shall eat up the produce of your ground and all your labors, and you'll never be any, uh, you will never be anything but oppressed and crushed continually. You shall be driven mad by the sight of what you see. The Lord will strike you on the knees and the legs with sore boils from which you cannot be healed from the sole of your foot to the crown of the head. The Lord will bring you and your king, whom you set over you, to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. You shall become a horror, a proverb, and a taunt among all the people where the Lord drives you. Now that's very, like, I can hardly bear to even read this. I mean, you can't read this with delight. And you think about the promises God made to them. I'm going to send you into this promised land. I'm going to give you victory. You will, you will win over these pagan nations who are far from me, whom I intend to punish through you. But now he's turning it all upside down. If you violate the covenant, he says, I'm going to turn your victory into defeat. And it's really, it's just remarkable, but he isn't finished. All right? Verse 38. And uh, where are we? Verse 38. You shall bring out much seed to the field, but you will gather in little, for the locust will consume it. 
You shall plant and cultivate vineyards, but you will neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worm will devour them. You shall have olive trees throughout your territory, but you will not anoint yourself with the oil, for your olives will drop off. You shall have sons and daughters, but they will not be yours, for they will go into captivity. The cricket shall possess all your trees and the produce of your ground. The alien who is among you shall rise above you higher and higher, but you will go down lower and lower. He shall lend to you, but you will not lend to them. He shall be the head, and you will be the tail. All right. Now, have I gone? No. So, okay. So this is, I call this one the economic devastation. Okay, this section. So they, they plant and they cultivate. That's their economy. But it doesn't produce. The cricket will possess all your trees. The alien who is among you will rise above you, and so forth. He will lend to you, but you will not lend to him. So that's economic devastation. Verses 45 to 57, political devastation. So all these curses shall come on you and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed because you would not obey the Lord your God by keeping his commandments and his statutes which he commanded you. They shall become a sign and a wonder on you and your descendants forever because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and a glad heart for the abundance of all these things or of all things. Therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, in the lack of all things, and he will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as the eagle swoops down, a nation whose language you do not understand, a nation of fierce countenance who will have no respect for the old, nor show favor to the young. Moreover, it shall eat the offspring of your herd and the produce of your ground until you are destroyed. Who also leaves you no grain, new wine, or oil, nor the increase of your herd or the young of your flock until they have caused you to perish. It shall besiege you in all your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout, throughout your land. And it shall besiege you in all your towns throughout your land which the Lord your God has given you. Then you shall eat the offspring of your own body the flesh of your sons and of your daughters whom the Lord your God has given you during the siege and the distress by which your enemy will possess you. The man who is refined and very delicate among you shall be hostile toward his brother and toward the wife he cherishes and toward the rest of his children who remain. So he will not, even, uh, he will not give even one of them any of the flesh of his children which he will eat since he has nothing else left during the siege and the distress by which your enemy will oppress you in all your towns. The refined and delicate woman among you, who would not venture to set the sole of her foot on the ground for delicateness and refinement, shall be hostile toward the husband she cherishes, and toward her son and daughter, and toward her afterbirth which issues from between her legs, and toward her children whom she bears, where she will eat them secretly for lack of anything else during the siege and the distress by which her enemy will oppress you in your towns. So, this is, I mean, you read this, like I said, this is very, very hard. Very, very hard to take. And then finally, the national dissolution, verses 58 to 68. If you are not careful to observe all the words of this law, which are, are written in this book, to fear this honored and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring extraordinary plagues on you and your descendants, even severe and lasting plagues, and miserable and chronic sicknesses, he will bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt of which you are afraid. They will cling to you, and also every sickness and every plague which not written in the book of this law, the Lord will bring on you until you are destroyed. Then you shall be left few in number, whereas you were as numerous as the stars of heaven, because they, you did not obey the Lord your God. It shall come about that as the Lord delighted over you to prosper you and multiply you, so the Lord will delight over you to make you perish and destroy you and you'll be torn from the land where you're entering to possess it. Moreover, the Lord will scatter you among all the peoples, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. And there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone, which you or your fathers have not known. Among those nations you shall find no rest. There shall be no resting place for the sole of your foot. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing of eyes and despair of soul. So your life shall hang in doubt before you, you will be in dread night and day and shall have no assurance of your life. In the morning you will say, would that it were evening. And at evening you will say, would that it were morning. Because of the dread of your heart which you dread and for the sight of your eyes which you used to see. 
The Lord will bring you back to Egypt in ships by the way about which I spoke to you. You will never see it again. And there you will offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but there will be no buyer. The cruelest cut of all. You can't even sell yourself into slavery. Now, that is a remarkable passage. I do want to make one comment before we sort of open this up a little bit. Notice in my notes there, I said, use of hyperbole. And I have a quote here from uh, Eugene Merrill. He says, the seriousness of the drought demands hyperbole for a proper description. Thus, the sky would become bronze, said the lawgiver, and the earth iron. That, that's mentioned in verse 23. But I want to say that he, he is using hyperbole all the way through. Now, that's a very fancy word. What does hyperbole mean? Does anybody know what hyperbole means? Marlene? Not, not a contrast. Exaggeration. Exaggeration for effect. Okay, so sometimes when uh, you know people will, you know, they're complaining about something and it is the worst thing ever. It might be just some little, you know, you know, your kids will do that to you. Worst thing ever happened. Well, it's not the worst thing ever. There's a lot of things worse than whatever they are saying happened to you or to them. And so, so that some of the statements here are extreme, okay? They're, they're meant to be extreme. They're meant to have an effect. Now, as we go through the Old Testament history, there were occasions when some of these things literally came to pass. When, when Jerusalem was besieged by the Babylonians, there were people who did resort to cannibalism. That is recorded in the history. That doesn't mean everybody did. And, that, and God isn't saying that here, but he is... He is using these words, these very extreme words, to really hammer home their obligation to keep the covenant. Okay, so that is something that we have to keep in mind. God isn't, uh, I mean, he's using very strong language. As I said, it's hard to read it. If you stop, you know, we're reading it and just sort of isolating this out out of the rest of God's promises and God's uh, provision for his people. But to read, to read it in isolation like this, it, it is, it's pretty tough on the, whole, on the heart, I'd have to say. Another quote from uh, Constable, he says, God designed these blessings and curses to persuade his people to obey his covenant with them. Stronger proof of the blessing of obedience and the blasting of disobedience is hardly imaginable. God's will was and is very clear and simple. Obey his word. All right, I'm going to pause. Are there any comments or questions at this point that you'd like to raise or that you dare to raise, perhaps? All right, anybody have something they Rob? Well, with some of these, like you mentioned, that some of them we can see have been fulfilled at some point. Uh, what about the other ones that are not fulfilled? Are they going to be specific prophecies in this section? Like no, okay, that's a good question. Are these specific pro prophecies? In a general sense, they are prophecies. In a general sense, this is the course that Israel followed. So they, they did disobey the covenant. Now, God didn't immediately bring every aspect of the curse down upon them. There were sort of fortes. So uh, you, recall, you may recall in Joshua, or let's see, not Joshua, but Judges. So we talk about the generation of Joshua and the elders that followed Joshua. That's the next generation. And then the, and then the third generation, then they started departing from the Lord. And, as we, and that's called the Judges Cycle, when we go through the book of Judges. So what happens in the Judges Cycle? All right, so they rebel. And then God brings an oppressor, another nation in. And they start, uh, they have various kinds of oppression, depending on the, on, the, um, on the situation. And let me think now, who was it that was, Gideon was uh, against the Midianites, right? Gideon was against the Midianites. And it, remember how Gideon was, he was thrashing grain not at the threshing floor, but at, a, at another place where you'd not expect him to be threshing grain. And that's because he was, they were, if they were to harvest their grain, the Midianites would come in and take it all. And that's in these curses. And so, so Gideon's trying to do it secretly. And uh, is it the angel that comes and says, Oh, Gideon, you man of valor. Here you are, hiding out. <laughs> what a man of valor. You know, you're, why, you're not standing up to these people. That's the message. But what the cycle is, so, you, so they have this oppression, first the idolatry, then the oppression, and then God raises up a judge. And some of the judges are better than others. 
The early judges, Othniel, for example, uh, is, is a man of great character. Some of the other judges, Gideon, Samson, you know, not your most sterling sort of judges, right? So even in the deliverance, there's a deliverance by the judge, but even in the deliverance, there's still judgment. And then they finally, we go through all this period, and finally uh, Samuel is one of the last judges, and they say, give us a king. We've had enough of this. We can't, you know, we can't live. And, he's, and they're going ahead of God again. Okay, so you see how this all works out. But then as we go through the history, come down to the final, you start uh, final judgments, and you read in the book of Jeremiah, and also, I guess it would be Second Chronicles and Second Kings, you'll read the record of the last um, uh, king of Israel, Zechariah, and how they were besieged by the Babylonians, and how all of that worked out. And they were taken away. And there is a phrase in here. I'm not sure. So I'll see. Um, oh, verse 62. Then you shall be left few in number, whereas you were as numerous as the stars of heaven. So that is a verse. There's a little hint of promise in that verse. What is the word, the term we would use for that hint of promise? The remnant. Okay, so you go through the Bible and you'll see in the prophets about the remnant. And the remnant, God says, there will be a remnant that will turn to me. All right, so then the rem, there's a remnant that comes back, even about the captives of Babylon. They come back to the land. From that period on, they have no more problem in Israel with idolatry. And then the Lord Jesus comes and they don't accept him. And guess what happens to them again? Then they are punished. They're driven from the land for the most part. There are some Jews that still live there. And then we go through all of history until we have come to this day. And there's still a nation. Now, not all of them believing, but there's coming a day, the Bible says, they will look on him whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as an only son, and they will turn to him when he returns. And that remnant will believe. The thing is, they have to live long enough to be able to, for him to come, you see. So, but that is the promise. But it's, it is a fearsome chapter, isn't it? All right, any other comments or questions as we go through this? I don't know if I answered all your question, Rob, but that's, yeah. Yeah, I sort of get going and I can't stop myself. All right, let me just look at my next note here. Uh, commentaries often compare these two chapters to ancient suzerainty treaties. I've talked about this before. These are agreements between a stronger king and a weaker king. So the suzerain, the, the stronger king, he imposes this treaty. All right, I will protect you. Here's what you need to do. <laughs> they, list, they list all the things they need to do. And in these treaties, there were blessings and cursings. And this feature, these two chapters, is one of the reasons that commentaries will compare uh, the, the Mosaic law to these Old Testament uh, suzerain, or not Old Testament, I'm sorry, but the uh, uh, ancient... Uh, Near Eastern suzerainty treaties that they find in literature in other, you know, in archaeological finds. Uh, I sort of resist this notion because I don't want to humanize the Bible. I don't want God to be just, well, uh, uh, I don't want to look at the Bible as God copying human forms. And I think there, personally, I think there are significant differences between what I understand of these ancient suzerainty treaties and the Old Testament. However, uh, the, uh, the blessing and cursing sections in the Old Testament law are very arresting. We cannot re read them without a shudder, I put in the notes. And this, so this is, uh, just as an ancient king would demand of a nation how they were to behave and in, 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 in keep staying in his good favor, so too God makes this demand on his people. All right. Now, I have a little bit of application, and that's the, we're trying to say, okay, what are we going to get out of this? So in the New Testament, God's people are in an individual spiritual relationship with God based on the new covenant in Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, the covenant is national. There is a promise in Jeremiah, is it 31? Seems like that's right. Jeremiah 31 of the new covenant and he talks about giving them a new heart. It's quoted in Hebrews. 
This is the new covenant that is made in Jesus Christ. And God now is going to, through the new covenant, deal with man spiritually on an individual basis. All right? But here's the thing. Who guarantees the blessings of the new covenant? Whose work guarantees the blessings of the new covenant? The work of Christ. You see, the failure of Israel shows that we can't even keep ourselves. Okay, so here we are. We are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has saved us from our sins. So what should we be? What is our attitude that we should have towards the Lord Jesus? Pardon me? Devotion. Devotion. Another word for that. Gratitude. Love. We should want to obey him every second and every moment of the day. Now, how many of you are doing that? If we were under the old covenant, what would happen? <laughs> you get the curses. But the, here's the thing in the new covenant. The curses already fell on Jesus Christ. They already fell on him. So maintenance in the new covenant is dependent on Christ's work, not man's. You, now, I want to say this carefully. You cannot keep your salvation by your good works. I, but that doesn't mean, oh, well, okay, then I don't have to do any good works. Okay? God can still deal with you. <laughs> if you, won't, if you uh, there are consequences for bad works. Let's put it that way. So why is that? Number one, as we see in the Old Testament, men in the Old Covenant seem unable to keep it, so the cursings lie upon them. Thus, becoming, this becomes a prophecy of their eventual fate. Number two, we cannot suppose that we would be any better in keeping a covenant than them. We share the same nature. Paul says the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Galatians 3.24, therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. Now, really, this is how we have to come. When we see this, all of this, this is serious stuff. When we see God's law proclaiming, this is God's will against sin, then we, we have to say, all right, Lord, I cannot save myself. I need Christ. Number four, the troubles of Israel experiencing the curses should warn men outside the new covenant of their desperate need. God requires obedience of all men and will judge sinners. If he was going to judge Israel, who was his chosen nation, he will judge sinners for their sin. So people who aren't believers, in our era, we're now in the New Testament era, there's all kinds of people who aren't believers. What will happen to them if they will not submit to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? They will receive judgment. They will receive a far greater judgment than Israel received in, in their, uh, in, in their uh, captivity in Babylon. They will receive an eternal judgment. So though this passage is very hard to take, we have to consider that only through the work of Christ can anyone escape the judgment of God. And besides escaping judgment, Christ gives us the hope of eternal life and victory over sin. So it's not, we don't look at the Bible and say, all right, okay, so I'll follow God because, boy, he'll get me if I don't. That's not the only reason. There is also the hope of eternal life. And that comes through Jesus Christ. We can't keep the covenant well enough in order to receive it. We have to depend on the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, any last questions or comments you'd like to make? Anybody? Maureen? I guess it just strikes me that in the, like when we are in the new covenant, it's such an easy thing to forget the holiness of God because yes. God is so gracious to us. That's right, and I think that's a good comment. Maureen says in, when at, in the new covenant, it is very easy for us to forget the holiness of God because God is so gracious to us. And it, it can become a little bit easy to follow the Lord. Well, you know, and we have forgiveness of sins. And so there is this tendency towards presumption. We should pursue holiness. We should do everything we can to know our Lord, to study our Bibles, to try to follow him, to apply it to our lives, think about God's will in various situations that Choices that you have before you every day. You know, should you do this or should you do that? And we have to think about God and how we order our lives. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else? Any, Maureen? Well, I was just, uh, when you just said that, like I, when you, I think being obedient in the little things 
of the everyday right. makes it easier to be obedient when a crisis comes. That's right, yeah. That's right. The, the more you obey the Lord every day, the easier it is to obey. That's a good comment. Anything else? Anybody else want to add something? All right. Well, it's a dramatic passage. Very, very challenging. Uh, let's uh, have a word of prayer, and then we'll have our final hymn. Father, we thank you for this time as we've considered this stern passage from the Old Testament. Lord, I pray that you would teach us from it to help us to, to truly trust the Lord Jesus Christ alone, that we, would, that we would turn away from our own wicked ways, that we would follow you with our whole hearts and be an example of the believers. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>